Hey everybody, how's it going? Dr. Incompetent here, and let's continue our beginner guide for a ranger with a Barachi Hunter of Okawaru here in version 0.25 2020. And I want to do something very, very quickly for science. Um, and that is, I'm going to push Shift X, and this lets you explore the dungeon with a zoomed out view. And you can use your arrow keys to move your marker. And then I'm actually going to wander up here. And then you can just push enter to kind of go to whatever tile you select. It's a great way for moving around quickly. In the console version of the game, you can just click on the minimap to where you go, but you can't do that here. Now, I was talking with somebody on YouTube in the comments, and I haven't replied yet. I'm just going to verify something about deep water and ammunition. In my experience, deep water used to consume ammo that would go into it but the viewer wisely pointed out that i am amphibious i can swim so see i can go on deep water so perhaps the game understands that because i can go on deep water as a frog um ammo is indeed retrievable on those squares so i want to see if that's the case what the game does with ammo so i'm just going to push fire and then i'm going to fire to this square by pushing the period and there it is I was 100% wrong then when I instructed you earlier about ammo disappearing over deep water. Um, as long as you can reach it and get to it, and because you can swim most of the time you will be able to, then you can get your ammo back as long as it doesn't mulch or break, basically. Fantastic. And I'm also not 100% sure if, if I weren't amphibious if the game would, instead of making the ammo be lost on deep water, if it would just pop it onto an adjacent square if it was available, like in the shallow water, so I could retrieve it. I don't know that about that 100%, but I did want to clarify that, and that actually makes being a Barachi archer even better because you don't have to worry about deep water swallowing your ammo. Now, lava, of course you do, but deep water, you're good because you can swim, you can cross it, um, and you move at the same movement speed, swimming in shallow water and um, deep water as you do on land. So, worth remembering. Most races that cannot swim move slower through water. Okay. Let's go down to Dungeon 4. And we have a hound skeleton right in front of us. I'm just going to shoot this guy. Even though he's in melee range, I still hit better and do more damage with bows most of the time, especially considering that, um, oops, the short sword I equipped is a short sword of venom. I can't poison undead dog, so, um, I need to just shoot it with a bow. And honestly, once you get better and better with bows, there's very, very little reason to ever switch to a melee weapon unless you have a really strong one and you have a particular brand that you need to inflict on the enemy. There's a snake. I'm just going to blast it until we hit it. And pick up a banana and some money. Ooh, we got another stack of 26 arrows right there. That means we have 73 arrows, and now we're starting to roll. I'm still just training bows, by the way, and I'm fine with that. You'll see that on our um, skill list, invocations turned on be when I began worshipping Okuwaru, if you start worshiping a god that uses invocations for its skills, then I believe this shows up um, as a trainable skill at that time. We will be leveling up invocations a little bit just so that we can reliably use heroism and finesse. Um, but luckily, because Okuwaru is a battle god, you don't have to level up invocations too much. It's one of the only skills that the Barachi is not good at, um, which is kind of amusing. And still, it's only a minus one. It's not the end of the world. And because with Okuwaru, we really only need to get it to like maybe a seven or an eight or something, we should be fine. Might take it higher. We'll see how the fail rate goes. We just found a cloak. I'm going to walk over it, push G to pick it up, and I'm going to push W to wear this baby. Look at that. A teal magisterial cloak that has raised our armor class by one. You need to be a, a frog in a cape. I mean, if you're going to go around, you need to let them know. All right, here's an ogre. 
Ogre is hard. Um, so what I'm going to do, I have no evocable items. I have no scrolls that I'm going to use here. And I have a potion of invisibility if everything goes horribly. Or haste. But in this case, I'm going to just see how it goes. I can't also even use um, heroism at the moment. So I'm going to just take a shot at this guy. And see how um, much damage we can do to him before he starts wrecking us. He is now adjacent to us, okay? So I'm going to be very careful, and I'm just going to shoot him. And he's hit us, and he's actually done a sizable amount of damage to us. He hit us for 14, or 15, I'm sorry. So at this point, now that he's hit us, I'm going to jump. And I'm going to jump as far away as I can. And we jumped all the way over here. And you can see his health. We hit him when he hit us. So we should easily be able to kill him. Now, I can't auto-fight because I'm too injured. Um, that's why it says you're too injured to fight recklessly. So I'm just going to push F and F, and boom, we killed him. I have enough hit points in armor class to take one hit from that dude. And my leap in this hallway is guaranteed to move me at least one square away from him. So that's why I did stand in melee for one round and fire at him. Because there's the possibility that um, he misses us and we can just finish him off. And I always like to save the leap if possible. Um, but that's my style. You might want to just leap preemptively, you know, and, and see how far you get and then start running if you don't leap far enough. I think that's also a fine style. I just felt pretty confident that an ogre who doesn't have um, armor on and is not very elusive, we would be able to kill enough with a four tile head start and a plus two short bow all right here's a food shop don't need any food right now thank you very much and let's just obliterate this jackal skeleton and a centaur skeleton get rid of them there we go and we're going to keep on um flying around we got a scroll of blinking which is terrific all right a blink is one of your best friends in the game for getting away from enemies hey look at that we got level seven terrific okay let's keep looking around All right, so I'm just blasting these orcs from far away. Um, but remember, orc priests can smite you and do a bunch of damage. So if this starts to go badly, we can leap up here um, and run away, basically. This is our escape route below us, unfortunately, because of how the exploring has gone. But we should be okay. I'm actually going to step up now and around here and through this. And then I'm, um, I'm doing this to try to keep that Orc Priest out of line of sight unless I can fire on him. Because I don't want him to just uh, take advantage of me too badly. Alright, let's kill the wizard. There we go. Got the wizard. And the priest is unfortunately here. Um, so I took a shot, and luckily we were able to kill that orc immediately, and let's just take this guy down. Okay. He was harder to hit than we wanted. This isn't ideal. It's taking a little bit of time, but we'll get there eventually. And luckily he didn't confuse us or do anything tricky, turn invisible. If any bad business would have happened there, I would have just run away. But kind of what you do is you just fire and you see how it's going. All right. So here comes Ijib. Ijib is 
an enemy. She's very tough sometimes. Sometimes she's really easy. Sometimes she's tough. What you want to note right away is that she usually has a wand of some kind, like a hexing wand. And in this case, she has a wand of polymorph. Let me just examine her. Um, she's a goblin, so she only has like 24 hit points. And that's not hard. It's just the fact that she's got a wand. If we get polymorphed, we're in not very good shape. And she becomes a lot harder when there's other enemies on the screen. All right. We don't have a cancellation potion. So we fired at her and she moved out of line of sight. Um, it hit her, but it didn't kill her. It only lightly wounded her. I'm going to step up toward the staircase. And I'm going to step onto the staircase. And I'm going to fire. And she's turned us into a bat. Okay? So when you get polymorph like this, you're not in the best shape. All right? Um, you lose your armor. That's why our armor class is down to zero. It melds into our body. You lose your weapon. We can't fire at her. But we are very elusive. We're a bat. All right? And I'm going to just um, go up the stairs. That's why I was on the stairs. And then we can just wait until the polymorph wears off and then go back down the stairs and take another shot. And just try to kill her before she polymorphs us again. Boom. Got her. It's kind of the way of it with a jib. You just really, really want to get her by herself, and being near a staircase is fantastic. Oof. There's some plate armor. That is amazing. One of the great things about Barachi is even though you're like a hybrid human character, you fit into armor. And um, you can see right now I just have ringmail on, right? Well, I'm going to wear this plate armor. And you can see that my armor class is going to go up to 13. My evasion will drop significantly. Um, but because this is plate armor, you get the benefit of a base armor rating of 10 and a huge GDR, guaranteed damage reduction. And so what this means is we are mitigating guaranteed a large amount of damage that's coming in. It's a huge base armor rating over ringmail. Um, let me show you ringmail. Ringmail is a five. So we're doubling our base armor, which is the minimum number of damage that we can mitigate from sources that are affected by armor class. So it's like you're rolling a die when you roll your armor class. And if you have high base, the floor of that random roll that you're doing to see how much damage you subtract from an incoming source that can be mitigated through armor class is higher. Now there's more variables than that, but basically that's just a general idea that you want your GDR to be higher as long as it doesn't come at the expense of your abilities. So let's see if it's doing that. If I just fire my bow over here, you can see that it takes 0.8 of a turn for me to fire my bow. If I um, remove or take off my plate armor, and then I fire my bow over here. Um, oop. It's between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. So our attack speed is the same. Um, it registers differently if you are, um, if there's another decimal place after that 0.8, basically. So it's not affecting our ability to fire, which is the main thing we want to make sh sure of. Um, and so I'm going to wear my plate armor. The only thing that it can do is mess us up with spells, lowers our evasion, and um, it makes us less stealthy, but we don't care about that. And then also, um, sometimes when you go to use your weapon, if you're not trained in armor, it can inhibit and prevent your ability to fire. But that's not a huge deal. In comparison to the benefit that you get from having plate armor on, in my opinion. All right, Dungeon 4 in the books. I'm still going to go ahead and keep training bows, by the way, but when we do want to train armor, actually, I'll just turn armor on right now. And one of the great things about Barachi is, look at that, I have a plus two aptitude to armor. So training armor is not that hard for me. So I'll do that. The higher your armor skill, the lower your encumbrance penalty, and you can actually completely nullify it, given enough strength and armor skill. And the more armor class 
benefit you get from any item that gives you armor class, like a, specifically armor, but you also can get higher armor class benefit from like gloves, helmets, um, cloaks, things like that. So armor is a great skill. It's not 100% essential. Damage is the first thing you want, but after that, boosting our survivability is tremendous. So that's what I'm going to do, especially considering it's costing me so little to raise up my armor just a bit right now because I have a zero skill. All right, let's move ourselves down. Okay, so there's a sky beast and a worker ant. The worker ant really isn't a problem. The sky beast is. Let's see if we can hit the sky beast before it turns invisible. Or until the worker ant gets on us, and then we'll just fight this guy right here. The worst thing the worker ant's going to do to us is poison us. And honestly, meh. One on one, not a big deal. All right, so here's the sky beast again. Now, if you've never fought a sky beast before, they are an annoying enemy that goes invisible. You can see here that the sky beast flickers out of sight. Now, because this happened as I was coming down the stairs, and remember, going up and down the stairs, look, at least for me with my movement speed, going down the steps took 2.5 turns. Time is passing as you go up and down, which is why you have to be mindful using the stairs anytime you use the stairs. Now, this is the last known location of this enemy, which is why it's indicated by this kind of like white silhouette. But I'm not sure if the Sky Beast is there. Honestly, the best play from in my mind is to just go up the stairs and look for a different staircase to go down. Now, Remember, if you're going down to a floor that's not fully explored um, and you're trying to use a different staircase, in the upper right of the corner of a staircase, it'll have an asterisk if you've never used that staircase before. So I know that this is a new staircase and it's taking me down to this other area. And in fact, you can see over here with the fog of war that the sky beast was potentially over here, but this is all old information. So we're very close to that staircase. Now we have a Crimson Imp, an Ogre, and um, an Orc. This is the Ogre down here. This Crimson Imp can be very dangerous if it has a wand. This one does not. You can tell by the picture. You can also mouse over it, push V, and get its information screen, and see that all it can really do is blink around and be annoying but be mindful that crimson imps can have wands and if they do they are devastating i'm just gonna um shoot this guy and see if i can kill him i can't i'm gonna move up the stairs and fight him here take him down okay now i'm gonna look for another staircase and i'll go to this one here's the sky beast and the Sky Beast is now visible. So what you can do when the Sky Beast goes invisible is just walk away if you can and just wait until it reappears. And we're going to try to fight it. Now it's on us. And I'm just going to keep trying to kill it. Okay, now a centaur is here and shooting at us, so we have to go upstairs. We're going to get blasted by the centaur, unfortunately, and the Sky Beast a little bit. So it's time immediately to hop away. I'm going to hop as far as I can this way. And I don't really want to polymorph this guy. I'm just going to take some shots and see how we do. That was a very good shot. Good shot. Okay, and now it's kind of us and the, and the Sky Beast. And I am going to just shoot again until we kill the Sky Beast. And we did. And you can see in the lower left, it says Okawaru accepts your kill. You can now gain great but temporary skills. So this is awesome because it gives us this ability called Heroism. You push A to get to your abilities. Now before we just had Hop 
And then once we picked up a religion, we can always renounce religion. But now we also have heroism. And you can see it costs two magic points, of which we have seven. And it costs piety. What does that mean? Piety is basically the favor you gain with your god by doing things that your god likes. Now, we worship Okawaru, who is a god of battle. So Okawaru likes when you kill stuff and when you fight. So we're doing great. We're gaining piety basically just by killing things. However... Heroism will reduce this piety. Our levels of piety are indicated up here very loosely with these pips. And at different amounts of pips on this scale, new abilities will open up based on what god it is. Now, it's not like a piety loss right here will remove this pip necessarily. You can push exclamation point to get more information about heroism, and it'll tell you that the piety cost is actually pretty small. So it's not a big deal to use this. You won't fall out of favor with Okawaru or anger Okawaru. Um, in fact, you can't anger Okawaru. The worst that could happen is that you um, lose enough piety to not be able to use heroism anymore, but that's fine. You'll get it back pretty quickly. It has an 11% fail rate. Um, and that's not great, but it's not the end of the world either. Remember when I was talking about invocations? This is the skill we can train to lower that fail rate, all right? Um, and so that is something for us to consider. Right now, I'm not really too worried about it. All right, I'm going to go back down. Um, this staircase and see where the centaur is. All right, so the centaur is there. I'm actually just going to show you what heroism does, and to, or at least try to use it. I'm going to push A, and I'm going to push A again. And it says you gain the combat prowess of a mighty hero. All right, and then let me push M and show you. All of my skills for combat are now in green. And it says skills enhanced by heroism are in green. So basically, heroism is boosting my skills by five, okay? So these skills were all zero, but heroism boosts it by five. If there's already some experience there, then it just goes up by five from whatever it was. So heroism is fantastic because, look, our bow skill is now 14. Our armor skill is now seven. In fact, um, our armor class is higher as a result. We're better at dodging. Our evasion has gone up. We're better at using a shield. We're better at doing anything with combat. So this little advantage should give us a boost against this centaur and let's see if we can take him down all right we're fighting each other and we've both hit each other but we almost have him dead let's fire one more time Oop, okay i have to just use a regular shot uh, it's getting close uh-oh okay shoo, we got it all right and um if i would have gotten hit there one more time i would have gone up the steps all right, now I'm going to go back up the steps and rest, get my health back, and go back down. And we'll pick up a bunch of arrows, and here comes the Crimson Imp. The Crimson Imp we're just going to shoot at. He can be hard to hit because he's evasive. Okay, here comes an Ogre. I'm actually going to use Heroism again and just give myself an edge versus this Ogre. There we go. And we get a bunch of experience for killing an Ogre and a bunch of Piety. So you can see we still have one Pip of Piety. We haven't lost anything. And we got level 8. And we got a bump of intelligence there at level 8. So that's nice. Our stats are nice and balanced. And we will want to be casting spells later. Now we got a bunch of arrows. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, that centaur didn't have a magical bow. If he would have had a magical bow, he might have been a lot harder, but it would have boosted us. His bow is actually worse than ours, so we're going to leave it there. Just take his arrows. And we're just going to shoot things. By the way, in the lower left, you can see there where it says, you killed the jackal. And then in blue, it says, Okuwaru accepts your kill in light blue. That's telling you that you're getting piety and favor by killing stuff, basically. Okuwaru likes it. Okuwaru approves. If you ever want more information about your god, you can push Shift-6 to open up the god screen and see... Um, some flavor text about your god. Uh, 
the title that you have right now from your God. So the God is calling me a combatant. And then your favor, which is like a kind of descriptive indication of your piety. Okawaru is aware of your devotion, so not a huge deal. Um, and then it shows you what powers you have in blue. And then the grayed out powers are the ones that you can unlock. And they are listed um, effectively in order of piety. So the higher your piety gets, the more of these will unlock down the list. You can then um, push exclamation point to shift between like an overall feel for what powers you'll get and what the god likes and then what happens um, what angers the god and what happens if you leave the god basically Okuwaru is a god that if you leave he will summon hordes of enemies upon you periodically until he is no longer angry um, I say he I don't um, I don't know if Okuwaru is a man or a woman um, I think we'll just say they then and just not worry about it. Um, but it tells you here that like if you are basically really high level when you abandon Okawaru, then you get equally leveled enemies that will come fight you. And if you're lower level, then you get enemies that are less powerful but still are challenging. Um, and so abandoning Okawaru is something that I did in my 15 rune victory with my Barachi because for extended, meaning trying to get more than three runes and win, when you really get into that five and beyond rune status, Okawaru um, isn't as powerful at that point. And so you, you deal with a lot of undead, you deal with a lot of mutations. So I like to switch to like the Shining One or Zin, something like that. But in a three rune victory, I would just stick with Okawaru the whole way. You don't need to change gods. Um, it's a complicated thing to do and it can punish you and kill you. Um, so I'd just stick with Okawaru if I were you. And that's what I plan to do for this tutorial. All right, I'm just shooting this phantom. I'm going to use Heroism because I'm missing this Phantom a lot. And I'm down to 39 arrows. And now I'm back up to 62. Ooh, a ring. If you notice, I have no gloves, boots, amulet, or ring. So a ring is great, but I don't know what it is. So I have six scrolls of Identify, which is quite a lot. And only two scrolls of Remove Curse, which is not a lot. So what does that mean? What it means is that I'm going to use an Identify Scroll on my ring. Normally, with jewelry, it's okay for non-artifact pieces to equip them. And then if they're cursed, you just read a Remove Curse Scroll and get rid of them. And you're fine. Equipping the item will identify it so you know what it is. But if you have more Identify Scrolls than Remove Curse Scrolls, actually, Remove Curse is at the premium in this case. So I'm going to identify my ring. And it's an uncursed ring of magical power. I'll put this on. It gives you... Rings of magical power give you like 9 to 10 magic points, basically. Um, which is great if you're a spellcaster. Uh, I'll show you. I'll just remove it. Um, you see I have 8, and then if I put it on, I get 17. So um, we're getting 9 magic points. It's not a huge deal for me, but it's better than nothing, so I'll keep it on. I have no potions to identify, and I do have one scroll that I want to identify, but I'll do that later. And let's just keep looking around. Ooh, we got a Wand of Digging with 7 charges, so... Um, now we have a Wand of Polymorph and a Wand of Digging, and I'm opening up this screen by pushing Shift-V for Evocables. Um, evocables are items that have magic within them that you can use. Wands have limited charges that you can get more charges of by picking up other copies of that wand. 
And then there is evocable items like lightning rods or phantom mirrors that you can use. And some of them break when you use them and some of them go inert and require gaining experience to charge back up. If you look at my skills, um, the skill evocations determines the strength of the wands that you're using when you evoke or use any evocable item and your ability to do so. Okay, so I'm not going to level that up right now. It's not important. Um, or I should say it's not as important as my other stuff. Okay. Um, but let's go back to this evocable screen. Now, Polymorph is a wand that you generally, I very, very rarely will use it. What it does is it takes the enemy that you're fighting and polymorphs them into an equivalent hit dice, which is basically like the level and difficulty of the monster, how much health it has, how many hit dice it has. So it, it takes the monster that you're fighting and if you bypass their magic resistance, it will transform them into something of equal hit dice. This can be really good if you're fighting something that has a very annoying ability that you don't want to deal with. Um, but it can also go very wrong and you can polymorph something into something even more difficult for your character. So it has some application, but I very rarely use this wand personally. Other people might use it to great effect. It's um, like, for example, even though they have pretty decent magic resistance, you can polymorph, say, a Hydra if you don't have a means of fighting the Hydra without chopping off its heads and hence making it more difficult. So you might be able to find a parallel hit dice enemy that's easier for you than the Hydra or something. Um, but I'm not going to mess around with it. The Wand of Digging, however, is very good because you can use it to blast holes in walls and find escape routes or create kill hallways or kill corridors or um, make shortcuts, things like that. So it's nice to get. Potion of Heal Wounds is also excellent. It is your primary way for restoring health via potion. Okay, so now we come on and we see two enemies, a scorpion and a hound zombie. The hound zombie is not hard, but the scorpion is more challenging. So what you want to do is instead of using tab to auto fire in a situation like this is push F to see who you're targeting defaultly. And in this case, I'm targeting the hound zombie defaultly and I don't want to. I'm going to move my target over to the scorpion and fire on him and try to kill him. And we will get to do so until the hound steps in the way. I'm going to use heroism and shoot the hound. And the hound dodged and it hit the scorpion. It's a nice benefit. And now the scorpion and the hound have switched places. And I'm just going to go ahead and boop, boop. And voila. All done. So you can see that heroism is a reason why Okawaru is a great god uh, for melee characters because it just gives you a little boost. It makes you more accurate, do more damage with your bow, raises your armor class, makes you evade more, all kinds of things that you need to do when you're fighting. I'm going to do it again against this centaur. You can see my armor class goes from 15 to 18. My evasion goes from 5 to 7. And then when I'm shooting this guy, I'm going to be more accurate. Boom, we actually just killed the centaur in one shot there. He had 20 arrows in his quiver, which is terrific, but he only had a plus zero short bow, which is a bummer. But whatever. We'll take his arrows happily. And we'll shoot the adder. You can see we're now up to 97 arrows, so we're doing really, really good on ammunition. I'm going to fire... And I don't want to hit this orc. I want to hit the wizard. So I'm going to take a shot at the wizard and try to kill him. 
he the wizard has moved out of line of sight so i'm going to use this opportunity to use heroism and now i'm going to take some shots at the wizard we got him and let's just take out the rest of these orcs they're throwing boomerangs at us which is funny at least to me it's silly um and we'll just go ahead and pick up all this stuff there's some magical leather armor there fine wow 128 arrows we're almost to the point where we just don't care about ammo anymore not quite but it's great it's not that and when i say don't care i mean we'll always pick it up for the rest of the game there's no weight with your items there's no stack size or inventory space for arrows beyond the initial one so there's no penalty for carrying around thousands of arrows um, i just mean to say that you don't have to worry about it when you're fighting you don't have to ration them all right here's crazy you wolf and um this dude has a plus three quarter staff of chaos which is a, can be a horrifying item it chaos like does a random thing when it hits you and it can do some very very bad things to you um you can go to the wiki to like get a full list of what it can do but it's generally not great anyway um he's behind this a translucent a ruined translucent door and what this means is just like a ghost fault he's locked in here forever unless i personally choose to open this door and so you can choose if you want to engage him or not. He has a plus one cloak on, which is indeed better than my cloak, but I don't think that it's worth fighting him for, in my opinion. If his cloak had a brand on it, you know, like poison resistance or something, and it was really good, then maybe I would consider it. But here, I'm not going to. All right, and I'm just going to um, actually push X and then push X. Ooh, um... No, wait a minute. Am I, I'm doing something wrong here. X. There we go. I'm pushing X, and then I'm pushing E on this tile to exclude it, and then I'm going to push E again. And that big red X just means this tile is excluded so that I won't step on it, so that my auto-explorer won't go try to look over there anymore. It just, you know, I can go there if I want, but I don't want to. Okay. Let's read our scrolls. All right, scroll of random uselessness, good. Glad to get that out of the way. And a holy word scroll, which does damage to all undead uh, on the screen, or in your line of sight, I should say. Okay, so now we know what those are. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push the forward slash, um, I'm sorry, backslash, that's above your enter key. And I'm going to turn off the auto pickup of certain things, um, for example, I do not want um, scrolls of random uselessness, but those are auto turned off. I also don't want any potions of stabbing. I'm not interested in that. I don't even want to pick them up. And I don't need any more rings of magical power. So I'm just clicking these. Plus means auto pickup will pick up that item type. And minus means auto pickup will ignore them. And these are all the items of these types that you have found and identified so far on your run. All right, everybody. I think this is a great place to stop the tutorial um, for this episode. I hope you enjoy this beginner ranger guide. We're now on dungeon level five. We've cleared it, in fact. Getting ready to go to dungeon level six. We have a god. We're eighth level. Um, we've got our nice plate armor that we got in this episode we've got a ring of magical power um we have some scrolls some really good potions here um and 128 arrows so i'd say we're cooking with gas i hope you guys have an excellent evening or day and i'll check you in the next episode take care